I'm very happy to have Sham uh, here today to tell us about results in uh, the complexity of uh, reinforcement learning. Sham. All right, thanks, Peter. And uh, definitely a huge thanks to the, the Simons Institute for convening uh, everyone together. So this talk's gonna switch gears from uh, looking at natural intelligence to uh, the artificial basis of intelligence. And in particular, we're gonna look at this reinforcement learning problem where we have an agent which wants to maximize some long-term performance measure in a possibly uncertain world. So, you know, like John's answer to Boaz's question earlier, uh, in these ad-based systems, we might be interested in uh, finding some way to uh, improve a long-term quality measure of the system as opposed to myopic myopically just showing ads. And one of the challenges we, challenges we face in these uh, complex systems is just that, you know, they're, they're high dimensional problems, we have uncertainty, and underlying this is we have this problem of generalization. Okay, so let's just uh, mention a few things with regards to generalization in the supervised learning setting. So in this setting, you know, we might think of uh, one of these data sets where we, uh, someone has annotated uh, what's the, the object in various images. Okay, and in these settings, we have a pretty good idea of how generalization is possible. Okay, and it's basically due to the fact that on a data set, we can try out various classifiers and see how well they do. And we have a pretty good uh, theoretical basis uh, of how this happens as well. Like, you know, we're basically doing well before we see every possible image in the world. Okay, and uh, you know, there's various settings where we have some theory here, which is for linear models, we know what's going on. Uh, there's a, a growing set of complexity measures which, which characterize the sample size we need. And even in deep learning settings, we have a pretty good idea of the capacity. In fact, like Peter was one of the pioneers in some of the early work on capacity measures of new, in, in neural settings. Okay, and we can think about the problem of generalization as really just being analogous to the supervised one in the sense that we'd like to do well before seeing every possible state in the world. You know, we'd like to do well before uh, hitting every game configuration in this game. Okay, so we'd like to do well with a number of samples that's far fewer than the number of possible states in the world. And that's really this, uh, the question of, uh, that we're gonna look at in this talk. How can we understand this issue of generalization in these rich interactive settings? In particular, we're going to also think of this uh, perspective from TCS. It's very helpful to look at lower bounds to see what isn't possible, which will give, give us insights into what types of assumptions we need uh, for when it is possible. Okay, so the first part is really going to be giving us some new insights uh, with regards to looking at lower bounds. Uh, and once we understand that, we'll switch to uh, upper bounds. Okay, the, the notation we'll use is uh, somewhat standard in RL. We'll try to keep it notation light, but this uh, MDP setting is we're an agent. We take an action A, uh, that advances the state. The next state is sampled from some underlying stochastic process. Okay, and a policy is some behavioral mapping which maps states to, states to actions. Okay, and in terms of two quantities, we'll refer to as this value function and the Q function. So the value function at a state S when we execute policy pi is just our future reward, say for capital H step starting at state S. And this Q function, this one step look at value is we start at state S, then we take action A, so we deviate from what we're doing, then we follow pi. Okay, so, so that's this Q function. You can think of it as like a one step look ahead. I'm at S, I take action A, then I follow pi, and it's my expected future reward uh, from, from that configuration. Okay, and uh, we'll specify the goals later, but we're interested in uh, long-term performance measures. Okay, so, so let's start with lower bounds and basically consider one of the, the bread and butter cases where uh, let's try to see what will happen when we look at linear models, okay? Uh, and, and in fact, let's actually look at uh, a somewhat simpler question, uh, which would be that of offline reinforcement learning. So in a lot of practical settings, uh, you know, we've collected data in some manner in which we're interacting with the world, but we've just logged it all, and we have a bunch of data sitting around that we've logged, okay? And now, what can we do with that? 
Okay, so, so we're going to look at this setting where we're no longer interacting with the world, that we just have a bunch of log data, but we're interested in, say, evaluating how some policy will work. So the simplest question here would just be this offline evaluation problem. So we, we've got a bunch of data sampled uh, according to the underlying dynamics. So our data set looks like a state, the action we took, the next state, and the reward. Okay, and we just want to evaluate what would have happened if we execute some policy pi. So we just want to get a measure of how good a fixed policy is. Okay, and, and what's nice about this setting is we can start looking at this in a way where we have gotten rid of the interactive component. We just want to do evaluation. Okay. So what are the, some of the challenges here with regards to evaluating uh, a fixed policy? Well, we can't run causal uh, experiments here because it's, we have observational data and we, you know, we might not have enough uh, data in various groups. Uh, and on top of that, we have this curse of dimensionality. There's just a lot of possible uh, you know, patient configurations and treatments we can do. Yes, I'm just using a running example from healthcare. We just have a lot of log data for sequential treatments and we want to evaluate some new tre treatment, but we want to evaluate this new treatment using the data we've collected. Okay, so, so let's try to get some intuition for when this is possible by looking at a simpler, a slightly simpler setting, which is a horizon one problem. So let's forget about the sequential decision-making nature of this problem and think of this as a one-shot setting. So here our data sets is gonna be a state, which is gonna be uh, some patient characteristics or action is gonna be a treatment and a reward is gonna be some measure of the performance outcome. Okay, and then let's think of this as a one-shot game. So there's no next state. Okay, and, and, and our goal is just to evaluate, say, uh, how some treatment will work on a new patient. Okay, the problem is this is just a lot of patient characteristics. So let's look at one of the, the simplest way to address this problem is with a linear model. Suppose we have some feature mapping phi whose dimension is much smaller than the number of possible uh, people and treatments out there. Okay, and, and, and the hope is that uh, because we're use, utilizing this maybe good feature mapping, this can allow us to generalize to new patients. Okay, and, and let's suppose for a moment we posit that the uh, performance metric is linear in this feature mapping. Okay, so, so when will this work? We're like, what are the properties we need uh, for our offline data set to allow us to forecast what would happen with a new patient? And this is like the simplest possible setting. We've got this offline data set, we have a linear, linear model. Uh, what can we say about a new person? Okay, so when does this work? Okay, so we're gonna make this realizability assumption. This is often what we call it machine learning. Let's just suppose the linear model is correct, that, there ex that this linear relationship is actually true, that, that the outcome for a person is gonna be linear in the future is plus some additive noise. Okay, that alone, if you think about it, isn't enough to do well because uh, we might not have coverage in our data set, right? Like suppose all the features were the same feature. We, we, this, this isn't enough information to tell us what would happen on a new patient. So we'll make this a uh, coverage assumption, which is if we look at our offline data set and we look at the covariance matrix, uh, it's kind of fat in all directions. Okay, so, so this basically means we're not missing directions in our feature space. Okay, so um, you know, if we think about linear systems, this is kind of saying uh, we have a well-conditioned linear system. Okay, so under these two assumptions, uh, with a moderate amount of offline data, we'll be able to estimate the linear relationship with least squares. Okay, we just fit the line and with a moderate amount of data, we'll have the property that for any new inputs or any new patient treatment, we have a good forecast of what'll happen. Okay, and it's important here that this is true for any, for any, any person that comes in, okay, under these two assumptions. So uniformly we're good under these assumptions. Okay, but again, so, so this is the horizon one problem, right? Because we're not assuming that there's a se sequential decision-making problem in this H equals one setting. Okay, so now let's turn back to our uh, evaluation problem for trying to figure out what happens over H stages. Okay, and, and let's try to uh, think about how we, might, how we might do this. Okay, and let's, let's think of, um, Let's write down two very natural assumptions 
uh, and, and try to think about the implications of this. And we're gonna extend it from the horizon one setting. So we wanna uh, estimate how good some sequential treatment is. And let's suppose right now that we have some features and that the long-term value function of our treatment is linear in these features. So at every stage, uh, the long-term value is linear in, in, in these features. So, so the idea is this would hopefully help us solve the curse of dimensionality. Okay, and just like the horizon one problem, uh, we know this isn't enough, right? We need, we need some more assumptions, but let's also suppose we have coverage in the sense that our covariance matrix of these features is uh, well conditioned. Okay, so we've got both these things. We assume our linear relationship is true everywhere, and we assume uh, we've got sort of a, a spectral coverage, that the covariance matrix everywhere is good. Okay, and, and why is this in, um, you know, why is this a natural starting point? Well, we can think about an algorithm which works, which works by moving backwards, right? At the last stage, this is our H equals one problem. We just run regression. We uniformly know what's happening. Okay, and if we know what's happening at the last stage for every person, it's not just on average, for every person, we have a pretty good idea of what's happening under these assumptions. And then the idea is we try to move backwards. We're gonna take our estimate at the last stage, plug it into uh, some estimation procedure going backwards and keep trying to move backwards. Okay, and we've got coverage. So in a spectral sense, we're not really missing any data. Okay, so, so the question is, will this work? Okay, this sort of backward uh, induction approach. Okay, and, and we can ask like statistically, will this work for any algorithm, not just this backward induction approach? Okay, so formally, uh, what we're saying is that we have some features that a long-term value function for all sort of state action pairs at all stages is linear in these features. This is a very strong assumption. We're assuming our linear model is correct. And we're assuming that our feature covariance matrix is well conditioned. Okay, so we're not missing directions in our data. Uh, and now we have this question, can we actually evaluate how a policy will behave had we, uh, if we run it? Okay, so the first result is uh, actually a bit disappointing. It shows that these two assumptions are not enough to do offline policy evaluation. In particular, it says for any algorithm and the algorithm can know the features, you cannot evaluate uh, a given policy. Okay, you need, the number of samples you need is gonna be exponential in uh, the horizon. So at h equals one, this worked fine, but you have this error amplification effect. So if you did this backup algorithm, you'd have this error amplification effect, but it turns out this is true for, uh, for any algorithm, that, that information theoretically, you cannot beat this. Um, and, and you can give uh, finer grain characterizations of this, uh, and some intuition here is what's going on is if, if we did this backward induction approach, uh, it give us an unbiased estimate, but the variance is blowing up. Okay. And this is a little disheartening in the sense that, you know, if we put a practical hats on, we don't believe the models uh, we have, like oftentimes linear relationships don't hold, data on IID, uh, we're missing groups, but this is a setting that even in the best case scenario where the linear model is correct and we have coverage, we should not ex necessarily expect it to work. Okay, so, so somehow fundamentally, when we start looking at the interactive learning problem, it really is different than the supervised learning problem, the way errors amplify. Okay, and this is real in practice too. We can come up with settings where we kind of mix data from two sources, we can come up with reasonable ways to train deep learned features. And we create a mixed data set. We try to evaluate, say, this running policy, and we see error amplification. So I'm just using this for, to highlight that this actually occurs in practice. OK, so now let's turn to the online problem. OK, so, so that was the offline setting. Let's look at the online reinforcement learning problem. OK, so what are the challenges in the online setting? The online setting is where we act for a while, collect feedback, and then you know, we repeat in some episodic manner. Okay, so now we've got to actually handle the exploration problem because if we act randomly, we might not discover things. We've got the credit assignment problem. We make an error. We've got to figure out which action in the past we should attribute to causing this error. And we've got you know, these problems of large state, state spaces and action spaces. This is this uh, 
OpenAI demo from a couple of years ago, the, the algebraic part doesn't really matter. The point here is uh, we're trying to do RL in you know, complex systems. Okay, and uh, so again, we're gonna be thinking, so now we're gonna think about this online setting where we start at some state, we act for a while and we repeat. And our goal now is rather than evaluation, we wanna find, you know, we wanna find a policy which approximately maximizes a long-term uh, performance measure in this unknown MDP. Again, again, we're, we're trying to do this with a small number of samples. And we're interested in this question of generalization. So again, let's start with uh, this simple setting of what can we get at with a linear model? And in particular, let's suppose the optimal value function is linear in some features. Like, is this enough to do sample efficient reinforcement learning? And, and this has been an, uh, an open question for quite some time. And it turns out that uh, under this linear realizability assumption, we still can't do R RL in the online setting. So formally it says we take this optimal Q function, suppose it's linear in these features. And we'll actually make life easier that we're gonna assume that um, the answer is kind of has a margin in the sense that the best action is substantially better than the second best action at every state. So the hope now is it should be easy to actually identify the best policy itself. Okay. Now it turns out that under this assumption, um, we still can't do efficient reinforcement learning in that for any algorithm, you know, assuming that um, we have this linear, linear realizable MDP and we have this gap and the algorithm can know the features if the algorithm does well, it will still need an exponential number of samples in either the dimension or the horizon to do well. Okay. And uh, this, is, this was definitely a, a question people had been looking at in the community for a while. Uh, the, you know, it's a series of papers, but this paper by Weiss, I would say this was really one of the breakthrough papers in uh, starting to understand this. And you know, this is a lot like a question of you know, having an LP uh, with some known features and trying to solve this LP with a certain type of query access, uh, except this, uh, except we know the corresponding L LP corresponds to an MDP. Okay, but this negative result is basically telling us that, you know, taken collectively, this is really saying to do RL, we need to be think thinking differently than the way we think about supervised learning, because the analogs of these assumptions in supervised learning when the horizon is one, we can do them. Th these are, are the standard linear modeling assumptions we make in supervised learning, but when you start moving to the RL setting, both for offline and online, it really breaks down. Okay, and, and that's bringing us to the question of what are sufficient conditions, right? Because the, the ways we think about supervised learning, if we just say, hey, we can model things with linear features in terms of the policy or the optimal value function, in, in terms of the, uh, a policy's value or the Q star value function, we're not able to do things efficiently. So this is, this is telling us we're gonna need stronger assumptions and what's the nature of those assumptions? Again, in particular, you know, the one, one of the ways we think about supervised learning, we have some type of hypothesis class and our, our relic could be some set of policies, values, or MDPs. And we're trying to understand what are the types of assumptions we need to make so we can do RL efficiently where the number of samples we need to do it uh, is not a function of the number of states in the world. And it's a function of say some complexity measure of the class. Okay, so we definitely need stronger assumptions because the simplest linear modeling assumptions won't work, but what's the nature of these assumptions? And once we start thinking about that, then it's, I think it starts giving us insight into what's going on. So I'm just gonna highlight um, one such assumption to, to contrast this, to kind of show you why the way we get upper bounds really does need to, um, we do need to make more complicated assumptions. Okay, so I'll give one historical example of where RL does work. Okay, this is this 
uh, Bellman completeness assumption. So suppose f is a class of linear functions. So these are functions linear in some features. Okay, so the Bellman backup operator so this is a little technical, but if you have some function, the Bellman backup operator is you add the reward. It's like this greedy one step look ahead backup operator when you're doing dynamic programming. So T of F is just R plus, you know, the expected uh, greedy thing at the next state. Okay, so this uh, completeness assumption, you should really think of it as just closure that when, if you have a linear function in the class and you back it up, it's gonna remain a linear function. Okay. So, so that's the assumption now. So this is stronger than the assumption of saying Q star is linear. This is saying when we back things up, it remains linear. And making this assumption, it's much stronger than the assumptions we had before. Okay, so one reason it's stronger is if you add a feature to this assumption, you could break it, right? We, like when we have a, if we're saying some function is linear in phi, if you add a feature to it, it doesn't break that property. But here, if you think about this completeness assumption, if you add features, it could break the assumption. And this is disappointing because it sort of goes against a lot of the things we believe in machine learning and in the practical part of machine learning, because there we wanna make models big because we're hoping to better approximate the world. But here, as you add richness to your, to your model, you might be breaking this property because you somehow need to make sure these features behave in some reasonable way under the dynamics. But under this assumption, you can do RL efficiently. And we might be interested in, you know, what are the other conditions in which sample efficient RL is possible? We're, we're already seeing that to do RL from a sample, sample efficient point of view, we do need to change the way we're thinking about the a problem a bit. And I'll just end with a sort of a picture on uh, what's been going on in some of the community that we kind of have these extremes here. We can do RL efficiently for these small problems, like tabular MDPs where it's a big table. And then these other extremes like this linear Q star, you can't do efficiently. And we're trying to figure out what's the, the space in between of what types of models we can do RL efficiently for and when we can. Okay. And like over the years, people have been proposing various special cases for when you can do RL efficiently. Uh, and there's been a growing set of complexity measures which govern when you can do things efficiently. So one of the most important ones here was this Bellman rank condition is re really ahead of its time. It has really captured some of the structural properties of when we can do RL efficiently. There's a more recent one, which I think generalized this notion, uh, but what's helpful with these complexity measures is we can look at our class and we can see that, hey, under these conditions, it's easy for us to tell that we can do it efficiently. And it makes it easier to design new settings where RL is efficient. But of course, there's things that might lie outside this region. And we know there's one that, you know, this, this other setting, you can do things efficiently. And from a, a min-max point of view, we might be asking the question of, you know, can we really come up with an abstract lower bound, which tells us that for some hypothesis class, can we learn it efficiently? It's not obviously this, this is possible, but in some recent work, you can actually characterize things in an abstract sense that basically given any hypothesis class, so for example, consider the set of models consistent with the linear Q star assumption. Uh, there's this coefficient, this decision esti estimation coefficient, which really does give you a lower bound telling you when you can do sample efficient RL uh, efficiently. So let me just uh, wrap things up. So and what's been happening in the last couple of years is trying to understand the properties in RL that allow us to learn. And the main point I want to get across in the lower bounds is that, you know, when we start doing RL efficiently, we really need to be exploiting some types of structure in a problem. It's not the supervised learning setting where you just have some hypothesis class, you get IID data and things tend to work. We really need to have uh, some type of underlying structure in the problem and to exploit this in order to get sample efficient algorithms. Um, and, and, you know, I've really been highlighting work from the community over the last couple of years. I just wanted to call out a couple of uh, the students involved who are heavily involved in this work, the Rusong uh, Wang, Gaurav Mahagan, who's here, and Yanhao Wang. And finally, 
you know, really a big thanks to the Simons in in Institute and uh, going back to Shafi's point of how, you know, a lot of these programs are uh, really expanding the lens of what we're doing here. So, you know, some of these workshops I, I'm referring to here, this um, theory of RL program for a semester and foundations of ML really were bringing together the, the theoretical computer science community with the ML community. And a lot of the ideas that I presented here were really things that had been discussed at these workshops and some of them people had been made, making progress while there. And, and definitely a huge thanks to Peter and Alistair for, for their uh, help over the last couple of years. So thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Questions, yes. Thank you for the talk. A quick question. Do you have any insights on based on this work on, for example, when you look at like Go, the success of Go, it, all of these assumptions break assumably, right? Uh, there's a the nonlinear model and there is no, uh, yeah. So if you can, I just want to understand, wrap my head around why, where, where does that model fit? Assuming, you know, that model is a good generalizable model. Yeah, that's right. So, so in a sense, like the, the reason we're thinking about this from the theory point of view is we want better algorithms here. And those of us who also play around with the practical side of RLs, RL doesn't really just work out of the box. Like in supervised learning, yes, we need to think about our architectures, but at the end of the day, you get a lot of data, a reasonable architecture, a run SGD, often things work. This does not happen in RL. And, and part of this picture here is to is, is to try to understand like other natural algorithms that can exploit uncertainty and where we can, can kind of replace the linear parts with nonlinear parts. So these like bilinear classes and stuff like that, that's moving on to like nonlinear hypothesis classes. And in, in the case of Go, I, I think one thing is this aspect that you don't seem to need deep exploration here, that just sort of playing randomly, you discover new patterns and you can kind of do gradient descent, that'll work. So, you know, so that's one type of problem uh, where if we think about, I think gradient-based method, there is a theory which can help us there, but there is a sense in which like look ahead, you know, moderate amounts of look ahead search along with local search seems to do pretty well. And in other settings, that type of exploration does not work. Okay, and that's where unlike supervised learning, the world really does shatter in RL, like the specifics of the problem really are coupled with generalization. All right, one more question, I mean. Yeah. Um, so I have a technical question uh, about, you know, you wanted to have this uniform for every A and S, but maybe that is not a feasible goal. Maybe you don't want to have for every single A and S a good uh, prediction. Or, you know, maybe we should not think about that, you know, uh, you know, maybe these states and actions are just so remote that we should not even think about. It. Yeah. Okay. So I, I mean, this question, this is a great question. So the question is like, look, if we think about the, some of the assumptions we're making, we're kind of saying uniformly, we're able to predict what would happen, at least in a, in a value-based sense, everywhere in the world. Okay. So this is sort of the two, two answers here that, um, from the lower point of view, this is only stronger that, uh, but you know, relaxing it will only make make it easy. You know, it, will, it only makes the problem harder. So, so making the problem easier, and you still can't do it. And and the problem with RL is, and this is why it's different in supervised learning. In supervised learning, all we care about is our average error for the most part. Okay, in, in practice, yeah, we we want to do better. But in RL, the the reason is that. Uh, we do need to extrapolate because suppose like the optimal thing never goes there, but maybe if we don't evaluate what's happening there well, we'll go there because we think it's good. And there is a sense in which uh, extrapolation forces us to uniformly do well. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to get at here. Like to what extent can we break somehow uniformly doing well, but this is really based on this meta point and why these lower bounds are so helpful to us because they're really saying that to get RL to work, it's very different from supervised learning. And you actually, you know, kind of all the assumptions we need, we actually kind of have to do well at extrapolation and understand 
what might happen in other crazy parts of the space because you know should we go explore this area some some something needs to tell us that we shouldn't go explore this area and that really is um more uniform approximation of how well we're doing everywhere all right we'll let's stop there for the break thanks let's thank sham again